Good morning, welcome to Terra at Home. I'm here with Colleen Zimmerman and we've actually ventured down to Niagara-on-the-Lake today and we're at Valley Brook Nurseries and we are going to be talking about planting perennials in, in pots. Yes, mm -hmm. it's one of the best ways to have everlasting, long-lasting blooms, texture, color and everything all in mm -hmm. a pot without and, having to use annuals. And that's the best part, so we'll kind of get to all the logistics of it all, but you have lots of different, I mean that's the thing, the whole, the world is yours at this point, uh, the variations in colors and textures. Definitely, it's mm -hmm. so wonderful to be able to work with perennials in pots. I've been doing it for years mostly because I ran out of space in my garden. <laughs> so I started putting perennials in pots and they are easily overwintered. Just bring them into your garage or into an, an unheated facility and it works out really well. That's the best part. So mm -hmm. you take care of them there in the, in the spring, you just put them back up, whoop, and there you go, Instant, right? You're done. And the best part is of perennials, as we know, as time goes on, they mature and they really just start to take on a life of their own, which is yeah, great. Yeah, they just flourish. Awesome. Okay. So today I have, uh, first I'm going to do a shade planter and then we'll do a sun planter. Perfect. And that, because some people, you know, either have, you know, some people have a nice mix of both and yes. some people know what they're dealing with. Maybe they just have one little patio area and it's an all shade. Well, here we go. Definitely. So the shade, you don't necessarily have to count on flower color because it is difficult to get flower color in shade. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with a lot of different textures for this one. This is a Simisifuga. Nice. And it's an upright plant. It does get a bit of a flower, but the texture and the color is just it amazing. Is. It's, it's beautiful. So it's similar to a fern, which nice. is this one right here. So we're going to mix in the ferns too. And although the textures are similar, the color contrast is really big. Right. And again, that's what you're really trying to go for, right? You're, you're, you're trying to get those, uh, again, as you say, the textures are similar, but the color difference really yes. is what's going to yeah. give you a lot of uh, um, characteristic to it. Yeah. And when you put the Character. plants in, you just want to break up the root ball a little bit because they have been in a pot for a while. Mm -hmm. So that way it just gets them going a little bit better. Okay, and then I'm, I'm going to include one other fern in here too. This is a Japanese painted fern. Oh, so this wow. is a smaller fern, but it kind of picks up on both the green it and does. the burgundy That's colors. It does. That's actually really nice. That looks good. And the ferns are really hardy and easy to grow, and they love the shade, and they just kind of keep going. So the nice thing about them is the texture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're, you seem like you're packing in there pretty tight, so you can get away with doing that? Is you that can okay? get away with doing mm -hmm. that in time, especially because these are going to be coming out year after year. Right. You know, you do have to separate them a little bit, yes. but yes. you know, you can go with the instant look on these ones too. Sure. And these ones here, these are both uh, hookeras. Right. So you can get hookeras with the dark green, or you mm -hmm. can also get them in variegated. So this one here is one of my favorites, it's called Blackberry Crisp. Mm -hmm. So you get the leaf texture in it as well as you get the color too, and this one stays quite tight. I'm going to take a little bit of the root ball. I love some of the names because it makes you hungry. <laughs> oh, definitely, I know. <laughs> so again, this picks up on the purple colors. This is beautiful though because it has these, like, again, these really nice little blooms on here. Right? Yes, yes. And I'm just kind of angling a few things too, so yes, it kind of spills out. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great about these, right? Some people you can see they get these huge pots, right? Definitely. And they're just pouring out of them. A lot of businesses will do that, right? And it's just, oh, they're just gorgeous. Yes, and you can do that with these ones too. And I probably have a few too many in this one, but I'm going for impact and full today. Well, so. that's right. We want to have it. So that's what television does. We want to see it. Boom, right? Instant. This is exactly. what it's going to look like. So. And you can buy like different sizes too. Like these are a little bit more established and more mature plants. Sure. So you're going to get that instant look out of them. Really nice so. though, and again, it's it's when it comes. It's funny when you're doing any type of landscaping or uh, plant design, that type of thing. It, it's all just works the same as if you were do, you're an interior designer inside, Definitely. and the way you're coordinating colors, and you have to think about all of that at the same time. And you can see how these just all work together. Yes, and so this other hooker that I put in here, it's called Delta Dawn, so mm -hmm. it's got the two colors on it. And then this last thing that I'm putting in here is a, a grass. It's a, called a Hakona Kloa, or Hakona Kloa tomato tomato and it's a <laughs> nice uh, it's a nice plant because once it fills out it'll spill over the side and oh, kind of wow. give you a nice texture so That's you get awesome. like so you get all your purples you get all your textures Beautiful. so when you're thinking with the textures you're thinking of you know light and airy mm -hmm. as well as some substance and then some linear foliage too very cool. You make that just seem so easy, but that's perfect. You just pot that, sold, done. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> good. That's a good one. Okay, so now we're going to so move over to ones that need sun. Yeah. So for sun here, mm -hmm. um, we'll start off with some height. So if you grab me that large grass mm -hmm. there, this is a Calamagrostis. Okay. So it's a clumping grass. Uh, this one's called Overdam. And the nice thing about it is that it is an upright grass, so it stays nice and straight. Okay. It doesn't spread out. So mm -hmm. even in the garden, and any of these combinations can be used in the garden as well. Well, that's a great part. So someone watching right now, they're like, okay, maybe I'm going to put it in a pot, but you can just totally turn your garden into exactly. that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then just use those in combination there. Sure. So just pick another one there. Um, okay. What do you think? 
Now let's go with that pretty pink flower there. All right, I love these. these this are... is Penstemon. Oh, nice. And it's, it, this one also attracts your hummingbirds and your butterflies, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And that, and a lot of times people do gear their uh, their their perennial gardens around um, what type of uh, you know specimens you're going Definitely. to attract. Definitely. Right? Yes. You want to have nice little birds in there and that. And it just gives you a little that pop of color. Yeah. And then we'll go with the daisies That's next. That's pretty. Every like garden that. needs daisies. Oh yes, absolutely. And you know what's really nice again? It's all about, you know, a lot of times, like this pot is perfect over here for this one. And I love this for, for yeah, the, the chartreuse yeah, green is the just chartreuse great. looks so nice with the color by having that, uh, that pink in there and the daisies. And again, when you're working with planters, you just kind of break down the, mm -hmm. the root balls here to make everything fit in a little bit better. Okay, and then if you grab me that trailing one in the front there. Yeah. Love this. We talked about this before. We talked about it, and then I went and bought a bunch of them. After. <laughs> <laughs> and I love them already. My, uh, they just look so gorgeous hanging because they and they open up in these big, beautiful purple stars. Yes, almost, the, right? this is the bijou clematis, mm -hmm. so it's a dwarf clematis, which works really, really well for trailing out of planters. Mm -hmm. And so this will just cascade down and fill out. That one's a and nice just be full one. Stunning. Wow. Just place that Gorgeous. in there, and then I think we'll just Which put one? the grass in this the grass? one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and then one again, one. another grass. This is a Carex. That's a cute one. And <laughs> it's just kind of a mounding selection as well. Mm -hmm. And it'll just Turn. kind of trail. <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> this will trail out the side too. So when you're thinking of perennials and planters, you want to think of different things because not all of them bloom all summer long. True. But you get that transition and that changing with grasses and textures. So again, there are a few things you need to think about. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I, as we've just proven here, whether you are going to be having this in the, the sun or the shade, and then again, having some height, yep. having some texture, color, and uh, and again, as you say, blooming at different stages yes. throughout your seasons. You want to make sure you to keep that in mind. That I love these. You're so good at this. <laughs> It's like amazing, you know, I look and then it's just, but again, as you say, right now, these are all quite established little plants. You put them all in here and you have an instant pot. This is just done for you. And you don't have to think about it for the rest of the summer. You mm -hmm. know, a little deadheading here and there. Sure. Um, with the shade one, again, with both of them, just water, fertilizer just to keep them going, mm -hmm. and then very easy care. Very easy care, and then uh, be, again, uh, before they get to the frost in the fall, take them inside. Yep. Anything you have to do while they're being held inside? Not really, I usually just water them. Let, mm -hmm. I usually let a light frost hit them first so they kind of go dormant, they know to go to sleep. Right, they know to go to Give sleep. Give them a little sure. bit of water, That's key. and then I just throw them in my garage, okay. and then next spring you'll see them start sprouting in the garage, bring them out, and you're awesome. done for the season. Gotta love nature for that, right? Well, very good. Great. So again, you've got an option. Hey, if you have just like mine, front at the front in the morning, you have sun in the front of your house, and then in the, as you go into the backyard, you get sun in the back. You've got one of these planters for each place, and uh, or again, as you say, make a huge garden of it. So, just go for it. Thank you, Colleen. Great. Good information, thanks. and also thanks to the folks here at Valley Brook as well down in Niagara on the Lake. Beautiful plant life. All right, that's it for now. We have more Tara at home to come. When I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Tara. your dreams come true at Terra, where color lives. Heritage Perennials, look for us in the blue pots.
Good morning. Welcome back to Terra at Home. And I'm here with Sue Ann from Sue Ann Staff Winery. So we're out here on your beautiful property with your beautiful dog. Good timing. Cue the dog. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Hi, Rex. How are you doing? Um, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about, uh, again, the whole process of, you know, obviously we can get in the process of wine making from one thing to another. But really right now, we, we want to talk about these wonderful vines that we're surrounded by here. And, uh, and again, you know, we were talking about the fact that over the course of this winter, it hit hard for many people, for mm -hmm. many different, uh, you know, factors. It was it was really a tough winter for a lot of people. Now, the ice storm and all kinds of uh, things. But uh, we want to talk a little bit about your vines, and we right. heard that there was same, some damage on some of the down here in the, some of the vineyards in Niagara. Right. Well, the, and the damage it really changes per location and per mm -hmm. variety of grape. So for here on the, our vineyard, for instance, the Riesling has come through no problem at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, however, the Viognier and Pinot Grigio, the varieties that uh, are on the cusp of whether we should grow them here or not, uh, as far as this far away from like Ontario, right. um, I saw some farther Sensitive. damage. So it's actually just starting to prune the, the Viognier right now yeah. because I wasn't confident they made it through. Aww. So, And then you have things that are a bit sporadic too. So this is actually from Cabernet Franc. Right. And um, so Cabernet Franc, you can see so this is just one of the arms off the vine I've cut off for mm -hmm. demonstration purposes. Mm -hmm. And um, so you can see how some of the buds have burst out really nicely, no problem at all. This is kind of right on track for this time of year. Mm -hmm. But then you can see how some of the buds didn't develop at all. Yeah. And um, so I'd say this probably is about 30% bud damage. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, yeah, so. And that's the thing. We remind people that uh, you know some of our segments we do tape ahead of time, so we're mm -hmm. a little bit ahead of time by, by showing this right now. Right. You know, obviously it's not July right uh, now when we are taping this, right. but it just gives people a bit of an example, and it's something that we can't we can't force all of a sudden grapes to pop out <laughs> <laughs> when we want them to. No. But again, it shows an example of some damage. So mm -hmm. as the course of the season goes on, you're going to really need to kind of stay on top of this because they are growing at different times. As you're saying. Yeah, they're growing at different times and at different rates. So mm -hmm. if you compare the different buds, this bud has probably popped out about four days before this one. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a bit of the uh, influence from the growing season as well, or from mm -hmm. this past winter. Mm -hmm. This bud got damaged more than this one. Mm -hmm. um, so at the time, as the season carries on, we're going to have a challenge with that too. So. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the little grape clusters starting to develop. I know, so. you can see that already. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah, and that's, that's and a flower though still. I guess it has to go through bloom. Right, it has to go through bloom. So let's talk a little bit about how this whole growing process goes and, and how much maintenance does it take to, to grow grapes? Uh, it, it is an enormous amount of work actually and so people say so what do you do through the growing season and you guys just watch the vines grow and away go oh yeah no, no, not quite <laughs> uh, so uh, so these shoes like this shoe here will get up to be probably about 30 centimeters long right and um, and so as it goes along we'll watch it grow we'll check for pests and diseases mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a big problem especially in the uh, more humid climate that we have mm -hmm. uh, also we'll be looking at how the berries are developing mm -hmm. um, and then how um, how advanced they are mm -hmm. and how they do advance uh, we'll also be training these so as they so if you imagine this on the vine mm -hmm. this way uh, these shoots will train them all to grow perfectly upwards uh, and uh, so we can really manage the growth have all the grapes in this zone here all the leaves up here so think about that that, that mm -hmm. in itself like that is oh. serious manual labor that Every is like te shoot. tedious mm -hmm. little process and that's the thing you know people um, have this this whole perspective on on winery life and the, the big <laughs> epic and you know it's this I and know. it's all you know, but it, it it's a it's a farm it is, it is. you're you are farmland, and you're 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 growing this product that is very very much hands on yes. and uh, and and it's sensitive in some respects, right? And it's very labor intensive. Yes. And so um, I would say probably our, our largest expense is the vineyards. Is the is the handwork in the vineyards. Sure. And so we want to get out here and be really efficient when we come out, mm -hmm. and we also want to do it quickly when we get here too. Absolutely. So part of the development in vineyards is, is about trying to minimize your your labor cost because it is so so pricey. So. So I can imagine you know once you go through all this process and then you're you know, and then you're harvesting in the fall, and then you're in eventually going through the process of winemaking from pressing the grapes all the mm. way through. By the time you get that bottle yes. <laughs> in yep. front of you, you must be like, oh, like that was a huge process, as they oh, say, yeah. from vine to bottle, right? Well, and that's what I love about being an estate winery mm -hmm. owner is that. Um, very few products that you make can actually take something right from the primary level, growing, growing, or making, or manufacturing, or mining something, mm -hmm. all the way through to a service level. So you, you go through the production, and you go through the making, you go through the bottling, and then you have to sell it, and you have the experience that goes with it. So mm -hmm. hence we do weddings on the property, we have food truck events, and yes. all the, as far as the other, so you're, other you're making this work, and then yes. you have to be on the other end being, uh, uh, so you're doing this with blue jeans and steel-toed work boots, <laughs> ripped blue jeans, <laughs> yeah. and then put the gala dress on to yeah. you know, entertain and then, people at a wedding. And that's where it comes from the other side of having, yes. a, having a winery, yeah. right? Use all your multiple personalities. That's, yeah. that's why I thrive at it. Oh, uh, you know what? <laughs> but you're, you definitely have the personality for 
forward and that's mm -hmm. the thing because you are yeah you're a farm girl right this right. is your you know you're you've been family farm for for many many years right yes, that's and right. Uh, and that's uh, that, that's what's that's cool that you're able to be both because some people yeah. can't well and soon uh, if I may do a little plug is um, mm -hmm. uh, in the LCBO you'll start to see wine highlighting that actually it'll be released in Amazing. early September called fancy farm girl okay. and it's highlighting about how I'm the really? farm girl and uh, awesome. have a bit more of a fancy attitude to life and how I approach it and uh, and the successes I have and haven't had Good with it and for so you. you'll see that's that always a nice uh, yes. that's a nice feeling too right 95 LCBO soon <laughs> Good though. So. That's a, you know that's a great bottle. That's a great price for a bottle of wine, yeah, right? I think so. It really I think is. So, um, so um, what actual what kind of bottle of wine is that? What type? Um, I'll have both a white and a red. Mm -hmm. uh, so the white will be mainly a Riesling. Mm -hmm. The red will be a Cabernet Merlot. Mm -hmm. And um, and they'll you'll know the label because it says Fancy Farm Girl on it. With a uh, you know one of them has a chicky with a you know the the uh, welly uh, oh, wellies yeah, on really and on a tractor okay. with the hair all boofed up. Oh, and that's so, it's so really sweet, awesome. So. That is yes. great. And you know yeah. what? And we were talking about the fact that you do um, events here and uh, we have another segment that we'll be doing as well down the road but it's it's uh, it's amazing the weddings and, and people want to be out in this space and be in this environment and mm -hmm. and really share in the, the, the process and, and they want to see what you do and they want to taste you know your, your, your beautiful wines and uh, this must be a neat sort of progression for you to get to this point because again mm -hmm. as you say it's a long it's a long haul because your family w originally started this farmland was what uh, so 200 years ago it mm -hmm. was just an open farm yeah. and uh, with uh, with uh, apples and pears yeah uh, and as time went on it progressed into uh, beef and to pork in the 60s we started to get into a lot of corn and grapes and in the early 70s we really dedicated ourselves to grapes that's where the grapes so we were very around. focused on grapes my mm -hmm. grandfather was very adamant we are grape growers first we're not a winery so I'm the first generation <laughs> to take it farther. So, uh, you stepped forward and said, guess what, Dad? <laughs> yes, yep, it's time to, uh, time to go. And so, you know what, um, this is something really every generation has wanted to do, but mm -hmm. uh, quite frankly, the whole estate winery phenomenon didn't exist until over 10 years ago. So. Yes, really. It's, it's, uh, it's exploded in a very concentrated period absolutely. of time, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So we're just waiting for the right time. Yes. <laughs> it just took 190 years to get there. <laughs> so. so, as we know, of course, uh, once uh, fall, you know, even though now is, you know, as we approach from middle of summer, mm -hmm. obviously the big, the big kick is grape and wine festival coming up in the fall and that's right. a big thing people need to can get on board shortly with that and start booking events and really getting it it's such a big event sprawled right across the region we start planning early for a grape wine festival because it mm -hmm. is such a busy busy time with grape and wine festival harvest is on mm -hmm. it is one of the busiest times in the winery as well so um, I'll have a booth down at uh, Montebello Park with awesome. uh, the rest of them and uh, try to keep it all under control and uh, then of course the passport program will be going to yep. $40 for uh, to have eight winery experience across the Niagara Peninsula so you pick your best uh, food and wine combination that works for you and away it's you go. It's such a great time and really people can venture around and have uh, have an awesome time and really mm. get to come and come here and visit you. I right? hope so. Yeah. Visit the dog. Visit the dog. <laughs> you gotta yeah, visit the dog. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Staff. We'll be back with more chair at home. When I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Tara. Make your dreams come true at Tara where color lives. You've sat under them and built forts in them. You've swung from them and fell out of them. You've even fallen in love under them. Trees have always held a special place in our hearts and memories. A natural beauty, trees will grow with you and your family and bring color and nature into your world. For your assurance of quality, look for trees and shrubs with the medallion plant tag. Medallion plants, locally grown, the pride of Niagara. Good morning, welcome back to Terra at Home. I'm here with Chef Mark from La Piazza Allegra restaurant in Hamilton. And uh, we're grilling again. We've been grilling mm -hmm. uh, for the last couple of weeks and we want to just, you know, add different components to the So we're talking about all the different ways that you can grill, right. uh, use your barbecue, get out there and use it, right? And we're using fish this time. Yep, this one is a swordfish that okay. I'm showing. But the reason why we're doing this is, this one's gonna be a marinade. Hmm. So we've done briny, we've done some dry rub. Right. Now this one is going to be a marinade, and we're doing two different kinds. This one is going to be a acidic mm -hmm. with a bit of a bite. Okay. This is going to be sweet. So when you oh. put the two of them together, oh, that's good. fantastic combination. Okay. This is something that I don't know, a lot of people probably don't cook with, but this mm -hmm. is dragon fruit. Yes. Dragon fruit and uh, swordfish. Mm -hmm. 
excellent combination. Oh, excellent, well, who excellent. Because <laughs> you know what? You just, one of those things you walk around, you say, I've yeah. never tried that, right. try it out. Right. Um, I started grilling dragon fruit mm. with uh, swordfish um, a few years ago, and it just, it really works really nicely mm. together. Because okay. it's got a, a bit of a kiwi and pear combination. Right. So, okay. And then, of course, the pineapple, you can't go wrong with pineapple. Sure. So, now, we know fish on the grill, um, some can be just fall apart and break yeah. apart, and it can be very difficult. This is a pretty hearty. This one's a pretty, have, right? yeah, this is a swordfish loin, so it's a little bit thicker, it's yes. not flaky, it'll mm -hmm. it'll grill very similar to what a steak does. Okay. So, okay. Um, now for this one, we're going to marinate, we have pineapple juice, mm -hmm. so there is some sweetness in there, but I have some Thai chilies, and I'm just going to split those, then go it's right in. It's always nice when you get that, just that little bit of heat coming, even as people who don't necessarily like spicy food, Sometimes we'll just like that little bit of heat coming through there. That's right. Right? Especially, as you say, paired up with the citrus. That's nice. Yeah. We have some lemon pe pepper. Mm -hmm. So the lemon pepper has some salt in it. Right. So I'm not going to add any more salt okay. just because it already has some. I'm going to add a bit of paprika. Okay. And I'm going to zest some lime into this. Hmm. Some very nice Now, when you're flavors. doing a marinade like this um, for fish, you can't let it over marinate. You actually have to maybe an hour to an hour and a half maximum. Because it'll actually kind of start to cook it, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's enough mm -hmm. acidity in there that it'll start to cook, which is another cooking method. Wait, ceviche, um, right? That's right. You got it. Uh, <laughs> I have a Mexican friend. <laughs> I have a Mexican friend. Um, no, but I just love that. I actually love the process of ceviche. I love what that does. And, and yes. it's it's amazing, right? Because it actually will, it's cooking in a, it's the citrus is what cooks that's it, right. the acid. It's the acid of, uh, of all the combination mm -hmm. that actually cooks the, the fish itself. Mm -hmm. yep. So for the fruit, we have some oil. I have some cinnamon. I'm gonna put a little pinch of cinnamon in this one. Mm. And I'm gonna add some brown sugar to this. Okay. Touch of salt. And then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take this dragon fruit and I'm gonna cut it very similar to the pineapple. So I'm gonna put the <clears throat> pineapple into this bowl. Now, a lot of people be afraid to um, to even buy a dragon fruit because they're not really sure what to do with it, right? But it is, it's a beautiful fruit. And it as you say, the combination of flavors, it's great. It works really well. And you know what? What I've done is I've left the skin on because the skin does wanna come off very easily. Yes. So it'll have a very soft texture. I've left it on to hold it hold together it. so when we're grilling it and then when it's on the plate, people can just pick it off. Oh, okay. It'll peel right off okay. for them. So I'm gonna put in the dragon fruit, and I'm gonna take this that we made, and we're gonna brush all this stuff here. This is great, because this is really giving people like major ideas outside the box, right, to, to think. When we talk about the fact that, yes, you can grill pretty much anything, but yep. yes, you grilling fruit is awesome. <laughs> grilled fruit is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it brings out some natural sugars in it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people like the taste of grilled fruit as well. Yes. Um, you know, whether it's this, peaches in the fall, pears, mm -hmm. anything like that, you know what, it works great as a dessert. It does. And if you're doing something like this, yes. you know, when you're making a combination for fish, you want to look at something that is comparable to the fish or what it's it's used to. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, mm -hmm. swordfish is a tropical fish, so you're gonna look yeah. at tropical fruits. Right, makes mm -hmm. sense. You know, you wouldn't want to maybe do a pear or anything like that or an apple with this one, so you, you do no. want to keep it. I'm gonna flip that around, because I do want that marinade to soak right in. And what I've done is I've turned the grill on high. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. you want to do a fairly quick sear on this. Now the beauty about uh, Predatory fish, swordfish being one of them, you can eat this medium rare to medium. It does not have to be cooked all the way okay. through. That's okay. Great. And that's, that takes a little bit of the stress off of grilling. It does. For some people, right? It does. You just, if you worry that, it, you know, that that's what comes with chicken, right? But with this, this you're okay. It's stress free. Yep. Okay. You, you know what? It's a predatory fish. It mm -hmm. can be eaten medium rare. Okay. So we turn the grill on high. I've kept the lid down on it and I've oiled, I scraped it and I oiled it. Okay. Just okay. Ask and you that'll that. give right. a little bit of a coating, yes. help it uh, from sticking as yes. well. Okay. Okay. So now we have two different sizes on there. So I'm going to put mm -hmm. the thicker one on okay. and I'm putting it over direct heat. Mm -hmm. As you say, because it is fish, it is going to cook quite quickly. It will. Okay. And I'm going to put the other one on top for a minute or two. And let's take some of this okay. and we'll throw it right into this pan. We'll let that heat up and then we can use that as a garnish on the fish after oh, it's done. Okay. Now, I haven't put the fruit on just yet. There's a fruit, all I want to do is I want to caramelize the sugar that I put in there mm -hmm. and some of its natural sugars, but I don't want it to burn or right. overcook. 
Right, and that's sometimes a little tricky. It's really, it's as you say, it's one of those stages left to the end, just boom, 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 right? Just a couple minutes, yep, mm -hmm. or a couple seconds, I should say, on mm -hmm. each side. Just caramelize that sugar and, and it's ready to I go. I love the combination of that. So you've got high heat, you've got it in there, close the lid, close let the it lid, sear. Let it sear. We're going to flip it once both pieces and okay. then we're good to go. Okay, all right, so um, combinations with swordfish, as you say, you were talking about the tropical side of things. Mm -hmm. um, outside of dragon fruit, what would you think of other fruit that you could eat? You know what, eat? papaya works really yeah. well. Mango, grilled mango would be excellent. Grilled mm -hmm. mango's a little bit trickier though because it gets very soft in the middle. I can so imagine. make sure that the, the grill is well oiled okay. and that it won't stick, or okay. you can do it on the skin side of the mango and just kind of cut it and. Uh, uh, oh. in wedges and then just roast it that way oh, so that it'll grill that's a good and, idea. and that'll okay. work really well. Because a lot of people are used to doing more of a, you know, a, a salsa on the side with fish, yeah. right? But yeah. again, as you said, the, the grilling component component adds another flavor level to it, right? Yeah, it's it just as you're caramelizing and it just gives it, just mm, try different things, right? That's it. Okay, Can't so that's on. what we'll do. We'll, uh, we're going to let this go. Quickly though, because <laughs> we don't want it to overcook. <laughs> we don't want it to overcook, fish. that's right. Magic of Television, we'll come back and we'll pair it all for you. We'll be right back. When I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Tara. Make your dreams come true at Tara, where color lives. The Hamilton Spectator at work, at home, or on the go. Read us online, in print, or download us to your e-reader. Get the Hamilton Spectator any way you want it. Welcome back to Terra at Home. I'm back here with Chef Mark from La Piazza Allegra Restaurant. And uh, we've been preparing swordfish on the barbecue. Yes. And some grilled fruit in there as well. Yep, I put the fruit on. Okay. Um, it doesn't take very long. And again, mm -hmm. you just want to start caramelizing it. You can see that, you know, the sugars are caramelizing, the pineapple softened up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we're on to plating. Oh, wow, awesome. We have that dragon fruit. Yep. There we go. And then we have our swordfish. And you're saying, you know, we we're talking about the, the density of swordfish, the, and especially from the, the loin cut like yeah, that. Yeah, you can see. It's really, look at that. Like it's, it's held together. It's a very firm cut. Like you'd almost think it was a piece of chicken or pork by looking at it, right? Yeah. But it's really, uh, that's great. It is. And then what I've done is I took the marinade off of the fish, mm -hmm. put it in a pan, and I just let it reduce. And you can see that it thickened up nicely mm -hmm. because you have that pineapple juice in there, so there's some sugar in there. Sure, okay. And then we're just going to give a nice little drizzle. Amazing. Now, do you do you serve uh, fish this way in your restaurant? I don't do it with the fruit. We mm -hmm. do swordfish. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, this is not really Italian, so. <laughs> no, it's not, is it? No, it's quite. Uh, <laughs> it's got a little bit of everything. It's very There's tropical. More, very tropical. Mm -hmm. So we do do swordfish in the restaurant, but uh -huh. we do it more of an Italian style. Right. Um, but it, so it's one like of my cooking. favorite fish to cook. Really? Yeah. Okay. I love the way. It, I love the way it eats, the way it presents it yes. uh, on the plate, yep. um, and I like the firmness of it. It's, it's not a flaky fish, so right. it, it is a lot easier to work with. Now, is there any risk of actually drying it out? I mean, obviously any fish, any meat you can, but um, you know, you were saying just a few minutes, right, on each side to yeah. cook it. Um, is it have a tendency to dry out quickly because of it, the density? It can dry out, okay. um, and the way to, to cook this is on high, high heat. Right. You have to do Sear it on it. that high heat, okay. otherwise it will cook very slowly, and as it cooks slowly, it will dry out a little okay. bit, Good especially tip. when it's that thick. All right, so Dara, TaraGreenhouses.com is our website for uh, recipes, and, uh, and always a great uh, visit down to your, uh, to your restaurant Thank to get you. a, an Italian version. An right? Italian version of this, that's <laughs> right. We're just trying to get people out on their grills right now, and I love the fact that uh, in the last little while we talked about marinades and um, brining, brining and, and dry, rub, dry rubs and lots yeah. of good stuff. Thank you so much. Always great to have you on the Thank show. Thank you. That's it for now. Have yourself a great weekend.